Kate Kellaway from The Guardian a few years ago, who wrote when she reviewed this first book, quote, there isn't much about Kellaway on record. I like that. He's just having yeah. a <laughs> He was born in Point Up, Wisconsin, and studied at NYU. And I suppose him to be young, although his age is not revealed. We can sort of judge you here. His day job is at a pie shop in Brooklyn, still true for now. No. Uh, <laughs> that shop is closed. Oh, uh, well, okay. That happened. I immediately thought of the show Pushing Daisies when I saw that. Uh, pie shop, there you go. His first book was Carnations. That's the one that's being reviewed from 2011. Yeah. Published by Princeton University Press, like the new one, The New World, which we'll be reading from tonight. Uh, and his honors and awards at, uh, include a Harvard Fellowship and a Lightning Award. Uh, currently teaches at NYU and not saying more than <laughs> and so of his new book, he writes, and here's the part I quote him. The oldest verses in this book were written in Paul Muldoon's backyard in New Jersey, where I first met, uh, where I first read Dante. The book took shape years later, where my, when my obsessive cycling through the Commedia del Arte and uh, got, got tangled and electrified in Claudia Rankin's Citizen and Tanahisi Coates' Between the World and Me. Thereafter, the songs and stories begin testimony to the collapse of those misinherited beliefs and imaginations that Rankine and Coase and many of us may wish to decry, reject, and hope to escape, and also singing strangely towards something like grace amid such disarray. But there's no pretending to escape these curses and purgatories. The poems told, took me, as Dante would, deeper into what encircles us. Only, unlike the Canadia's harmonic realms, the cosmos of the new world are ever collapsing, enduring for only moments at a time. Which I thought I would end with because I heard a few of these poems the other night and that really seemed to capture what uh, I think struck me most forcefully about them. So if I may now welcome up to this modest but lovely stage um, <laughs> my friend Anthony Carell. Thank you. technician telling my wife and me that our unborn boy could hear our voices, that he was old enough to hear our voices. My, my, my little Columbus, adrift at sea in utero, you're already reaching for worlds to come. Tracing the screen, more ink blocked than portrait. We draw what is from what is shadow. Lima bean, hawk beak, owl sprint. It's you, steering to face what moves across your new ocean. A distant story man on distant story land. Shouldn't I open with some cute synecdoche? less maniacal, the spirit invoked homes to only gilded horizons. Couldn't I, shouldn't I, soften my shape by shifting sounds? We were there, pilgrim, distant this night, be it me or be it thunder, you hear beasts of one and all. Savage to you, I hesitate in this thicket of you. I step out to meet you, to sound on the shore for which you are bound. Please, my angel, and listen, and listen, and listen, and stay. So the 
book's subtitle, of the, its title is The New World, and the book's subtitle is Infinitesimal Ethics. And um, as I was thinking about this the other night when we were reading together, I tried to come up with a, a definition of that. You all know what the words mean, but I think I was imagining a, a story that involves a, a hero's quest, um, one that might endure for a very long time, but whose action takes place in an instant. Maybe that's the comes and goes in an instant. And this poem um, is the first infinitesimal epic that I wrote, and it's based in Jamaica Plain. Mm -hmm. And one of the stars, one of the stars of the poem is here tonight. Maybe you'll get to meet her after the reading. Uh, the poem is titled, Charlie at Full Speed. Sure. Annabelle put it best. Give us more Charlie at Full Speed. Yet on that day, we can't forget. Nothing much happened. Though Boston was simply a blaze, the oar had proposed a game of bocce. And so his father, Howie, dove deep in the closet to scare up some sun hats. The only one that fit me was a chartreuse affair with an acre of floppy green and made a pale flower. Photo worthy, said Luca, adding, Anthony, really, it's a bad architectural experiment on your head in taking play pity. Her hands scaled the scaffold to the cornices, debending the satchel on the end. But I digress. Charlie at full speed. It being our very first day together, Annabelle, Anthony, Rivka, and Howie, with Lior the hub of our orbits, and being Howie and Rivka's first game of bocce, I'll call it our inaugural day. So, in short, five of us, Misfit hats, a park in Jamaica Plain, nothing much happened. Charlie, their greyhound, came to a rescue. Delicate, rather handsome, and placid, glacial placid. Until his flame sharp head shot straight through Annabelle's thighs. Be polite, Charlie, Howie said. And Charlie was. Leashed, he loped, lay down, and loped on alongside us. As our underhand bowls of blue and red balls, so rarely very close to the pale Polino or Jack, led us up the park moraines and down through the paths. To cool off, we'd shade ourselves in the still warm craters of tree shade. And Charlie got loose. But before that, some small talk. I love your sunglasses. Ah, good, Rivka, nice toss. Making a documentary about 26 on my bed. Charlie's the first greyhound I've ever known. How long in that apartment? I'll sit out the first round. It's hot as hell. What do you teach, Rivka? And so on. Our small town. It's barely built of language. A two stones hit clicking, not quite to exchange it. But isn't the ceasefire built of such material? And won't it get even smaller the smaller we're able to see? Charlie sighed and sighed and sighed. Ah, nuts. I hit a rock or a root or something as a red ball headed off squirrely down the road. Then Charlie got loose. Invented at the height of the Roman Empire, the game of bocce boasted the wrinkled booklet dug up from the bottom of the canvas tote. In yonder, no dogs off leash hollered back a rust-lit parks and rec sign. He sighed and sighed. When the dog sighed, I thought of that false friend sigh, ages and ages hence, the one prophesied by Robert Frost, that most misread of exhalation and subsequent delusion of a nation. 
how less and less is insignificant, how more and more is insignificant. In the year the boys bombed a marathon, in the year I resolved to text you a pix. And it may be beside the point, but along the way I might add, I've been playing a fairly mean game of bocce, scoring five to your three, your one, and your zero. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Move aside, now observe, and the poet will show you just how it's done. And then, you're dead, Corelli. That was the oar. As if just pretending the wind means the world. Leashed, he looked, lay down, then looked on alongside us. Then Charlie got loose. We all sure got along. The brute, he helped. Quick look at Charlie. The headline of the local rag that morning read simply baked bean and got chuckles all around. Across the field, a tessellation. Every shape a Charlie, Charlie, Charlie at full speed, an omega far off. Watch the road. An arch or a line storm when close, then dash. A teardrop, an oval, over oval, over oval, counter clock. Charlie, no, watch the road. And so, Charlie, no, the five of us sallied forth, flying, fingers of debris, sailing out centrifugally across the paw drawn ruts in a race dog's mind. Poor Charlie, someone said. Poor Charlie. Though nothing much happened. By then the Greyhound had stopped. Charlie, now still, extended his throat just a little, just enough so his flickered tongue could taste the skin of the salt city now spinning above. Then, quite close to America, Charlie sat down, knelt down, then lay across his red leash. He looked at none of us. He entertained no prayer. He breathed, breathed, breathed again, and set down his throat on the dirt. Charlie at full speed. Like a sand white shard, the eye catches, only obliquely, watches let go as an earth blue cup shatters, better naturally still. Who's Toss? You're Toss, Annabelle. And she said, just you wait. Then scattered the rest of us with the best ball of the day. And there came a hey, hey from the hilltop. Three silhouettes, not friendly, wriggly, obviously drunk. Wormy arms lifted three black cans of black beer in the impure white sky, saluting us, who, when seen from such a distance, must also resemble mere shades of ourselves. Or the enemy tribe. Still, I get the sense whenever I tell this story that, had those phantoms not been keeping watch, we'd have lost our hold on the dry slope and slipped right out of Massachusetts. Hard to 
to narrate um, and hard to remember. Um, ought to, to make a place to stand for those little feet. Um, the new world. It's true. Pillow. For you, it may be that nothing happens anymore. That life is this going on all around you all the time, nothing else. That this land is blank land. This land is blank land, from California to the unnamed island. That from an Apollo staircase, you may leap each morning, a moonwalker, to discover the plains of Kansas, at last devoid of people mm -hmm. That hallelujah, now the cavalry, may ride at your command, crusading backward through memory, their sword blades true with all we know now but couldn't know then. Great stars, immense burning, so faintly printed on a noontime flag, reminds us all that it is so. That grace may await you, nonetheless, that in this in between breath you may find your rightful home in these stories that no one remembers, that without you. No one knows. Disoriented, and it's disoriented. It's a poem about uh, misremembering another line of poetry by a, a Russian poet named Osip Lomlishtam, um, who uh, was you know, uh, among the supreme uh, lyricists of human history, but certainly the 20th century. Um, and you know, probably, probably is. But I, that was part of the 
the, um, of the energy of this poem is just a deep, deep love for this, this poet. And um, my misremembering a line that he had written, which um, was a small affair. It didn't have to be public. Kind of but, <laughs> small um, but um, it uh, was born out of that misremembering, and then the day where, again, nothing much happened. Um, but through that misremembering, um, there was such uh, uh, an intense, Maybe not an intense shame, but such desire to know, like to look it up, and then that you know sends you down another three months of reading him or something. But it was all born out of just misremembering this line. Um, and in this poem, that energy um, gives shape to an appearance of what was upon the shot uh, in Brooklyn. And the poem is titled "Osip in August." There was also, as there was a photograph I lost, I remember better now. As there is a bird and a wolf in a black foil path running back to old songs. As those songs that even the singer never heard, I remember. As while on coffee break this morning, we saw the poet Mangesham and didn't skip people. There was also older than he ever lived to be, staring at his hands held up, cupping sunlight. As one happens to know, though the world disconforms to the poem, the poet's arrival is perfectly natural, even inevitable. So wholly so, that he barely notice. As an iced latte is just so good. As only later, as these appearances germinate, I begin to see what I saw. As I recall the geometer of empty Arabian sands. As I hear the train's whistle in prescient whispers of a kindness stove. As I hear the great mustache. As I'm astonished to see Osip older, balder, shorter than one judges from the last photo. As outside cafe regular, he stood statue still on the sidewalk, paying no heed as we passed with our coffees in hand. As one click earlier, awaiting our lattes, I had misremembered and so had misquoted, and then I corrected, so I thought, one of Osip's exquisite lines. It was sound, I said, not might born into the fingers of mortals. But I, Osip wrote, I have forgotten what I wanted to say. My friend, did you notice the old man praying in the street? As the moment remembers me reciprocally, I remember the hand made of worms in the arms of a clock face during the true time. I recall that at the end of December 1938, at an uncertain hour, Mangeshtam dies. The poet skips off or a chance path of jump boats aligned just this once in the mist. I recall these facts have arisen from a fiction. As the photo I remember is the path curving back to silver songs. As there's that tiny double portrait of the poet, one front facing and the second shot in profile, images I lifted today from the curb where they drop like sparrow wings, separate and askew. Who drops them? What brother of Osip has just passed by? As the ages rush around in their infinite uniforms, no two the same, I return to Moscow, quiet as a coffin. As Osip's woolen suit is too heavy for the season, how his sleeves were striped and sweat and wrinkled like sun-ruined skin. As I remember his hands held up to his chin, up in palms together as he, as he uh, uh, bows in close to the pages, as if his verses had been puzzled by time, transmogrified to tongues like English, wholly unknown to the poet. As like death, in time, the portraits become irresistible, 
as half of Asip's feathers are broken or missing. As the poor man's feathers are broken or missing and thereafter the story is born. As even across 80 winters, in one glance, you've recited the story in full, and the image itself is somehow now soothed for the moment, as a lost child held by a stranger in a crowd, as already a nomad, or exile rather, he's banished to the east, then re-banished further. As in Vlad Vladivostok, in the midway of his life, he dies of ice and failure, or so the story goes. As in the last photograph, he appears much older than a man of 47, though not half as old as he appears to us today. But I also writes, I've forgotten what I wanted to say. As this was us in 1920, that our cold drinks appeared on the counter and we carried them out. As we entered the painted, unparticular fortress of that Brooklyn street, overdomed by London plane trains, bashed in by ivy townhouses, and busy only with the tow-headed kiddos who flashed downhill on their scooters. And there was the pilgrim, and there was a bird and a wolf and a stone. And here's the poem. It's the ruins, not the fortress, we recall and recite. Not the fortress, but the stones we trip over on land we mistook for untouched. That here the earth spits up time's architecture, the stone footings of our proper soil. Here are the holes in the hands that we build and we build to forget what's lost. That that was also in the circle, so as not to awaken a man so involved. That that was also as we parted and swallowed the seas to the left and the right of his body. That that was also recalled by misremembered verses. That the bird and the wolf are still here, patient in the roar of the moment. And that it is sound finally, not light, pouring into his fingers. It is sound, not light, pouring into our fingers. That it's the song bird elegizing us of today. And that it is us, friend, stepping these immortal steps away. I remember that. essays and reviews. His first collection of poetry, Tom Thompson in Purgatory, won the National Book Critics Circle Award. His third, Syllabus of Errors, appeared on the New York Times list of the best books of poetry published in 2015. John Moore's most recent, this very present, book of poems, Earthly Delights, was written in a time rather like our own, a time of great uncertainty and anxiety. Some of its poems are political in the sense that they're confused, frustrated, impatient, angry. All of these, the poet suggests, are responses that are merited, indeed demanded, by the irrational and at times insane political landscape that currently imposes itself on us, on our relationships with one another in our attempts to carry out lives and projects of goodness and value. But the poems are not angry or dark, let alone despairing. Despair, John Moore has written, while occasionally justified, is more often than not cheap self-reassurance and engenders very little other than more despair. Mm -hmm. So, Jalamore sets forth statements in favor of life in the world, sources of genuine and meaningful consolation. I really wanted it to be a book about delight, Jalamore has said, the delight we can take and find in poetry, in language, in song, the delight we take in movies, 
one of my favorite art forms, the exquisite dazzle of a moving image, of a smile, or a kiss blown up vastly larger than life and projected onto the screen. The delight we take in one another's company, in the world in its natural beauties, and the delight we take in the quiet, unremarkable moments of our lives, in an ordinary afternoon spent at the beach, or such ordinary experiences, as hearing the sound of a baseball hit by an aluminum bat from a long way away. This is my choice language. Um, so now I'm, I'm pleased to invite uh, the earth through the light himself <laughs> to the stage. Troy Dalmore. about it. It's very unreliable, but you hope they're there. So, this is called Muse. Muse, wear me like clothing. Fade into my skin as I unfurl for you like an oyster shell or a work shirt bleached by sunlight. I've hung on the line for so long, here under the moon, to make this dark space inside where a song can suffer and grow. Mouth, mouth, move against me. You will sing, and then you will sing, then you will go. Then I will sing, then I will sing, and then go. Anthony, I really liked that last poem that you read about the Handel stuff. That was really lovely. Um, Kevin, you don't still have the uh, Stalin elegy or some an epigram memorized to you. Oh, okay. memorized? I, yeah. 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 No, I no, don't. No, so I can't put you no. on the spot by having you oh, too No, I, I, I have. It's been too long. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't put you on the spot anymore than I already have. <laughs> That'd be great to hear it. But. <laughs> too bad. <laughs> I'm so um, sorry. No, no, we're just, I'm just, just, I'm 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 just, i am just 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 you have done this too, haven't you? Raise your hand if you have. <laughs> no, the other one. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know whereof I speak. Raise your hand if you have ever asked your readers to raise their hands, knowing they know you can't see them. Yes, you are of my tribe, of that we can now be certain. Welcome, friend. Here I am, living half a life because I can't remember. And this way, I know that I'm dead, but only a little, and not in which direction. Welcome, friend, in the glass, at the bottom of the glass, bottomed, boat. Are we in this together? Raise your hand if you are. Raise your hand if I am, but you're not. Raise your hand if, like me, you know whose ghost you want. To hover over this. Thank you. That's very sweet. Thank you. <laughs> this is a poem about a poem that will never exist. Um, I'm sort of fascinated with artworks that will never exist or have never existed. For instance, I'm really fascinated by, when you read a novel and there's an artist in the novel and they have written a novel and you want to read that novel, would you like to know this? It actually exists because it's all fictional. Uh, and I've started making a collection of those or references to them and sometimes in a book 
you'll get like a single line of the novel or something like that, or a paragraph. John Irving will give you some that, you know, lots of it. Yeah, it's great. He'll give you like a whole chapter. Or yeah. Italo Calvino will do that kind of thing. Or in the film The Great Beauty, which is just such a magical film, Jeff Gambardella has written the novel, and you get to hear one single line of it, <laughs> but everyone talks about how beautiful it is. And because you don't get to actually know it, of course, it's sort of perfect, and you imagine you know, how great it is. So, so I'm fascinated by these fictional artworks. And then I'm also really fascinated, I just published a little essay about this by artworks that I will never get to see because it's too late. Like um, the example I talk about a lot in that, but there's many examples, is uh, that Andre Gregory did this legendary production of Alice in Wonderland in the early 1970s, and I've read about it, and I've you know, heard people who have talked about it, but of course I'll never get to see it. And again, there's something really magical about that because I'll never get to see it, so in my imagination. It's so good. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it really was so good. I'm not sure it could be as good as the one that's in my imagination. So, so this is about a poem that will never exist. Um, and this is called The Poem You Will Not Live to Write. The poem you will not live to write. The poem you would have written if only you'd had one more month, one more day, one more hour is a killer. A no-holds-barred, balls-out masterpiece. The one where you put it all together. Everything you learned, everything you suffered, all the, bent, all the bits of being human you spent your life gathering up. It's the poem you have been waiting for all your life. The poem you will not live to write. The next poem you would have written after the last poem you will write, which is, it must be said, a perfectly decent, unexceptionable, unexceptional poem. The sort of poem you would have read in some magazine or other had someone else been the author, or made it through the first half anyway, and then maybe turned to the theater reviews or the gossip column, or else just put the whole tiresome issue aside, is, let's admit it, a knockout. There's no avoiding the fact. The poem you will not live to write is the one that would make the grocer's daughter come back to you. It's the poem you'd wear like a pair of expensive stolen shoes to a wedding you weren't invited to. It's the one that waits for you in the dark, unseen in the underbrush, just outside the campfire zone of protected light, with nothing but an uninhibited, passionate kiss and your death on its mind. <laughs> that tiny, quiet little applause. Um, this is called Spices. You have gotten the scent of spices on your fingers and carried it through customs, crossing borders that isolate one people from another. Those who wear violet on Tuesday from those who put on green on Thursday. Those who bestow the emphasis on the second syllable from those who accentuate the third. The ones who dust the meniscus of their morning, of their evening coffee with particles of cardamom from the people who, in the way of their grandmothers and grandfathers, show a preference for a sprinkling of cinnamon. And this one is a little bit longer, but don't panic when I say that. It's not long, <laughs> just longer. I think that's important. I did a reading once. Heather was there. Heather knows the story I'm about to tell. I'll keep it short. I'd have to keep it short otherwise, because it's about length. Um, <laughs> I, did a, I did a reading, and uh, it was for Zizava, which is a wonderful magazine on the West Coast. And uh, so Oscar Villa, on the editor, put this reading together with six readers. I was the last. I don't remember why I was the last. Um, all five readers ahead of me went over time quite a bit. And so it was turned into a lengthy evening. And it was uh, late by hot. the time. It was hot. <laughs> it was late by the time I got up there. The chairs were very uncomfortable. Not like these. These are wonderful. You know? <laughs> these are terrible, <laughs> terrible, like Russian gulag chairs. I had to shit them. <laughs> it was just awful. So everyone was really ready to go by the time I even got up there. And, and so the, I was reading a single poem that I had published in Zizaba, and it was a poem of some length, though again, not long. I mean, a long poem is like a book, like, like the, the Cantos is a long poem, right? It's supposed, you know, but also I had cut it down to fit in my 10-minute length, so uh, I was the only one, I would have been, oh, I was the only one of the readers who actually kept to the 10-minute 
But of course, nobody had any way to know this. Anyway, Oscar got up to introduce me, and for some reason he thought this would be a compliment. He said, this is George Ollymore, you know, he published him once before or something. This poem, Vertigo, is going to be, this is the longest poem we've ever published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what did he say? <laughs> and he honestly thought, like, people would hear, oh, a long poem, that's awesome. They have no idea. What he, and I could, I could see their faces, and I knew what it was doing to people. So Oscar and I had to talk after that. <laughs> Oscar's the most wonderful guy, but that was just crazy. <laughs> so, this is a poem called Marvelous Things Without Number. After 40 or so summers, you kind of get the idea. The slow deepening of the plum blue dusk that offers a backdrop for the stately silhouettes of disconsolate, sentinel-like telephone poles. The fading chorus of evening bird song, The sharp hollow pong of an aluminum bat making contact with the ball somewhere off in the distance, followed by the joyful and at the same time somehow mildly forlorn minor uproar of a clutch of children cheering. Eventless days at the beach, the scorched sand stinging beneath your feet, the sand in your clothes and your hair, a relentless ubiquitous grip that remains undislodged after any number of showers and shampooings, the familiar dirt that col collects underneath your fingernails and your hair growing longer. Careless afternoons endured and discharged in the backyard hammock, or a languid folding chair by the lake, reading Amy Clampett, reading Rilke. Teenagers playing an eternal game of monopoly or risk that might well be the very same game they started last summer. The same hummingbirds taking the same flight paths back to the endless empty abundance of the same backyard flowers and feeders. Some friends are renewing their vows. They were married a decade ago. Some friends are driving up to one of the casinos on Friday to hear a tribute band who have modeled themselves after Led Zeppelin or Journey. <laughs> a friend who left me for the East Coast two years ago has flown back to Chico to take photos of Mount Lassen exactly 100 years after its catastrophic eruption. For a while, it feels like everything is a reenactment of something that has already happened even dumping a skitter of raisin bran into a bowl and then pouring milk over it, or sitting on the porch or trying on sneakers, takes on the aura of a ritual. Are you trying to deny time and change, to say that death will have no authority here? Or are you celebrating the fact that everything is in flux and ungraspable? Or is the season doing one or the other of these things for you? Mornings glow like dreams, like memories, with a radiance that has been lying latent at the earth all night. You can do it again, whatever it is, but you can't do it over. The beautiful girl, kiss, can't be unkissed, and who would want that anyway? But you might. And so you repeat, 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 feeling rich with existence and time, and a kind of exhaustion you have learned to savor. The end of side B, after all, simply means that you flip the record over and listen to side A again. And did you say that life would always be this way? Or would you to were you told that by someone in the past? And now hang on to that belief in the face of what must be mounting, but for now, still invisible evidence to the contrary. Stay invisible, you say to it. Stay, you whisper. Stay just as you are just a little bit longer. Which is just another way of telling the story you tell the children every night. How the birds and the rivers remembered the songs, even when the people forgot. And how, when the people regained the ability to remember, they learned the songs again from the birds and the rivers. The children's wide, trusting eyes as you say this, as if what you said was, to use that phrase we used to like to use, the gospel of truth. It's only a story, after all. You mean no harm. No one means any harm. The world is ancient, full of shades and spirits, not all of them friendly. And we do with it what we can. I think there's a reference in there I probably have to explain to the younger people about flipping the record over. I think some people have no idea. Catch me afterwards, we'll talk about that. <laughs> I have a little instructional video. Um, I think I'll read just a couple more. I, I know that some of you may have places to be in the evening that you like you know, more than you expected, so I don't want to go on at length, especially after my experience with Oscar. <laughs> so 
Um, maybe I'll do, I'll do this one, which is a sonnet, and not even mine, it's a translation. And then one more with a little length, but not too bad. And that'll probably be enough. So this is a Mallarmé poem uh, called A Toast. The original was called Salut, published in 1893. And I haven't done many translations. I've worked on a fair number, and I'm almost never happy with them, because I really try hard to capture the original music as much as I can, which obviously is an impossibility, because it's a different language. You just can't. But the exercise is wonderful. Every once in a while, I get one where I feel like that's close enough that I can let it out there and let people see it. And you know, translations are a wonderful thing. I mean, I have benefited so much over the years from the translations of others and been able to experience at least some degree of, of works that I just would have had no access to otherwise. It's just, thank God for translators. They're, they're the most wonderful people. So, so this is, I think, the third I've ever, there's two in this book, and there's one in my previous one, so I've so far published three. So I don't think of myself as a translator, but I dabble, and it's fun. And Mallarmé is just amazing. He's, he's just incredible. So this is called A Toast. It's nothing, spume poem, pure fluff. Names nothing, names only this vessel. In some faraway sea drowns a passel of muse mermaids, ass over tea kettle. So, my various friends, we traverse these waters, I astern and on course, you the lush avant-garde, cleaving asunder the onrushing flood tide of winters and thunder. A drunk spell so lovely inspires me, though the deck's pitching, I'm without fear, to stand and toast what we hold dear. Solitude, rock reef, or star, whatever it is that calls forth the salute of our bright blank sailcloth. And so I think I'll just read one more. I think I want to say before I end, I love reading anywhere to anyone who will listen, but I especially love reading in bookstores for reasons that are probably obvious enough that I don't need to explain them. But you know, this one in particular, all this poetry here, it's so inspiring somehow. And thinking about the people who have been here and who I'm sure have been here, it's, we've been through some hard times. We're still going through some hard times, but you know, maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I certainly like to hope so that there's still places like this. I mean, that thing I wrote, with Ant which Anthony read, you know, that I, I called the book Earthly Delights. There's a long story about how the book came to be called this, which I won't tell. I will only say it had a different title before, and, and Heather, who, among many other things, does quality control for me, uh, disapproved of that title, and so I decided I had to change it. And uh, came to call it Earthly Delights, and it does feel like the right title, because with all the darkness lately, you know, with all the difficulties, um, Pushing back and celebrating even really small pleasures, even really little things that are so easy to overlook feels so important to me right now. And so, yeah, to be here, to get to read here. Um, I, I hope, you know, we both got books for sale and you can buy them if you want, but if, whether you do or not, I hope you buy something here. And I hope that those of you who live around here come here a lot and, and buy their books because we need places like this to stay open. Yeah. So I just really want to thank everybody who's helped with, uh, involved with this. And thank you so much for helping to organize it. We really appreciate being here. Thank you all just for coming. And being here. We, we all have other things you could be doing. It's a great city. You know, there's many entertainments here. I know that. <laughs> your, your entertainment options, you know, it's like they say on the airline, right? We know you have many options. Thank you for choosing us. <laughs> so, all right. So I started with the first poem in the book, and this is the last poem in the book. Um, and also the most recent poem. I, I wrote it, or started it in Sardinia just before the pandemic hit, uh, and then finished it over a couple months that followed. It's called Odysseus Departing. Sometime between the seventh day and the 77th, or maybe the 700th and 77th, when the maker's task was more or less completed, and all that remained was to tidy up some degree and perform the final inspections. Odysseus, his journeys and homecomings lying still in his future, not yet the stuff of myth or legend, not yet a set of tales to be told round the fire, not yet a make-work project for generations of scholars and interpreters, finished supper and announced that he would go to bed early. He was to depart in the morning, lying in that massive oak-rooted bed 
the soft body of Penelope prone beside him, he watched the last light fade to blackness, turning his life from a three-dimensional figure into a film noir silhouette. She was worried about Telemachus growing up without a father. And so he stroked her hair and gently reassured her, the boy will never be without a father, even when his father is far away. He did not say, because he knew she would hear it whether he said it or not, and that it would be better if he did not say it. And even when your husband is far away, you will never be without a husband. Neither of them had any idea how long he would be gone. Neither knew of the plague of suitors that was poised to descend on the house. Nor had she yet begun the skein raveling and skein unraveling that would occupy her hands and hold them at bay for years. Odysseus could never really sleep on nights like this, the night prior to a journey. But he did not dread the long hours of in-betweenness, the dim light like being underwater, his body pressed against her warm and cherished body. The weight of the years to come, of the battles and travels dimly sensed, weighed down on him. And although he had meant what he said, and all that she had heard, even though he had not said it, he was a human, and so not immune to fear, to dread, to prospective regret, projected toward every night that his wife would be forced to sleep the great bed alone, growing older by the hour, his son growing older by the hour. While he laid his body down, who could say where, on cold rocks, most likely, under unrecognized stars, wherever a space could be found, between bodies or in the space where there were no bodies, aching for her presence, his body frisked by the waters and winds. He was not afraid of dying. He almost craved to know how it felt, that last journey, that adventure. But the idea of staying dead forever, separated from life and sun, was awful. Our fear of death, he thought, inclines us to certain theories regarding time and the gods. In the morning, he sat at the table with her for an hour, almost, saying nothing, sipping tea, and when it came, came, kind, <laughs> and when it came time to go, she kissed him gently on the cheek, then on the lips, harder. Then they went outside to stand in the sun, and she lifted up their boy, so the father could look back and see them both when he reached the edge of the property, which he did then turned away and shouldered his pack with the lunch she had prepared for him and marched down that as yet untranslated road. Thanks so much for being here for listening.